responsible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Good evening, I'm Cynthia Smith of KCPT. Thank you for joining us and taking this opportunity to learn more about the three people hoping to become the next United States Senator from Kansas, hoping to keep the state on the nation's political map, as did their predecessor, Bob Dole. Now, the candidates are Republican Sam Brownback, who is representing the Topeka area in his first term in the U.S. Congress. The Democratic candidate is Jill Docking, who works as a stockbroker in Wichita. Also from Wichita is the reform candidate, Donald Clawson, who works there as a certified public accountant. Thank you all for being here this evening. Before we get to your opening statements, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Steve Rose, publisher of the Overland Park Sun, and Steve Kraske, a political correspondent for the Kansas City Star. We will also be hearing questions from voters during this evening's debate. Our candidates drew straws earlier to determine the order of opening statements, and you will each have two minutes. We will start with Donald Clawson. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. The reason I'm in this campaign is that is because our country is headed downhill financially and culturally. Our debt is at $5.1 trillion. Under President Clinton's new budget, he's going to raise that to $7 trillion over the next seven years. A baby born today is going to have to pay $187,000 in interest on the federal debt over its lifetime. I believe those levels to be unsustainable. Let's look at federal spending. President Clinton proposes to spend $1.64 trillion over the next year. That means we taxpayers are going to have to cough up $1.64 trillion for him to pay. That is $6,200 per person for every man, woman, and child for this year. I believe that's an unsustainable level also. Let's look at the tax burden we have. The tax burden is one yardstick by which we can measure just how socialistic we have become. Over the last 45 years, our tax burden has doubled. It's gone from 23% of the average family income to 43%. And guess what? That tax burden is going to double again over the next 35 years. By 2030, that tax burden is going to be at 82% tax rate. That's to pay for promises already made and passed in the legislation, 82%. Our forefathers, when they revolted against King George III, they were being taxed at 5%. So what can we do about this? I think we taxpayers are going to need to get mad and motivated and demand that we have a national referendum voting system so we taxpayers can vote on all major issues and set the parameters on those issues. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Docking, your opening remarks, please. Good evening. This is a critical election. Kansas is at a crossroads. The center of the U.S. Senate has been hollowed out. Esteemed senators like Nancy Kassebaum, Sam Nunn, William Cohen, Bill Bradley are all retiring. The strength of the Senate has been its tradition of balance, pulling ideas from Democrats and Republicans and coming to compromise and closure. The Senate has historically been a moderating influence on the whims of the more volatile House of Representatives. What will happen if we don't replace the senator? Center, we will either tilt to the left or to the right or have total gridlock. The Wall Street Journal recently called the departure of moderates depressing. I'm running for the U.S. Senate because I believe we need more centrist in Washington and because I'm concerned about the direction of Kansas politics. The far right is trying to take over in Kansas. We see it in the legislature, three congressional races, and now in this Senate race. If Sam Brownback is elected to the U.S. Senate, the Senate will no longer be the moderating influence on the extremism of the House but instead will tilt seriously to the right. Today, Sam is going to try to sound like a moderate. We're going to hear a great deal about the three R's, reduce, reform, and return. But there's a fourth R, Sam, and it's responsibility. We have a responsibility to our parents and grandparents to provide for the solvency of Medicare and Social Security and a responsibility to the younger generation to balance the budget. We have a responsibility to our children to invest in education so that families can afford to send their kids to college. We have a responsibility to make our neighbors safer so that every parent can sleep easier knowing their kids are secure. It is not my job to vote with Newt Gingrich 94% of the time as my opponent has done. 
It is not my job to vote with Bill Clinton 94% of the time or Bob Dole 94% of the time. It is my job to vote for Kansas 100% of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Docking. And our final closing remarks from Congressman Brownback. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Excuse my hoarse voice, please. We've been wrapping up this session of Congress and having some very late nights and doing that and getting some of the most historic legislation through that we've ever had. I thank you for joining us this evening to learn what each of the candidates is about and how we'd represent you in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to have the backing and the endorsement and the support of such people from Kansas as Nancy Kassebaum and Jan Myers and Bob Dole, people who have long represented this state in Washington and done an extraordinary job in doing that, people who have given us good representation and represented Kansans the way Kansans would want us to be represented. And I won't be voting with people like Jill Docking would be of Ted Kennedy, who if she is elected, she'll put Ted Kennedy in charge of the same committee that Nancy Kassebaum is currently in charge of. I see as what we need to do in the future is that we've got a great opportunity to really have the next 10 to 20 to 30 years be historic opportunities of great hope and opportunities if we'll just do a few things now. And those few things consist of the three words I've been campaigning on. Reduce, reform, and return. Reducing the federal government, its size, its scope, its intrusiveness, while at the same time protecting key programs like Medicare and providing for a strong national defense. Reforming the Congress, and I've been one of the leading reformers in this Congress, but we need to go further with things like term limits and pension reform and returning to the timeless values that built the country. Values like work and family, and a recognition of a higher moral authority, wherever you might choose to worship. Those three things, reduce, reform, and return, are a balanced approach to be able to restore the American dream, to be able to give our children, your children, my children, Abby, Andy, and Liz, that hope and opportunity for the future that we each had in growing up. That's why I'm running for the United States Senate. That's why I'd like to have your vote in November. Thank you. And for all of you for those opening remarks, now you're each going to be given one minute to answer questions from our panel. And after each of you has answered that question, there will be time for a brief rebuttal. Our first question is going to be coming from Steve Rose, and it will be directed first, Steve, to Jill Docking. The teachers union, uh, the NEA, has become a lightning rod for those who think that public education needs major reform. Some see the NEA as an obstacle to that reform. What are your views on public education and the role of the NEA? I think that's an outstanding uh, question. I have been a volunteer in the public school system for many years now, and I can tell you that our teachers work enormously hard to try to deliver the kind of education that they need to to the kids. Um, in terms of just looking at education, I think it is enormously important that we save some of the programs that Congressman Brownback has voted to cut in education, including college loans, safe and drug-free schools, tutoring, and Head Start. I recently was a tutor in my little girl's fifth grade class and I sat down and I was supposed to tutor in algebra and I will tell you that the difference between the kid who got it and the kid who didn't was about three grades. I think it is enormously difficult for our teachers to handle all of the alternatives in those schools and that it is important that we continue the program of tutorials for high-risk children. Congressman Brownback, your, your answer please. Um, it's a good question. We all support strong public education. I do hope that Jill will start to get some of her facts straight because we have increased student loans, increased them over 50%. And I hope if you're running for a public office that you'll get your factual information straight. <clears throat> to me on education though, what we should be doing with education is pushing decisions and dollars back to local units of government and back to states. And that's what I think we ought to do with much of what we're doing on education at the federal level. Over 90% of education is funded at the state and local level. About 7% is funded at the federal level. And yet we get nearly half of our regulation from the federal level. What I'd like to see us do is to send more of the dollars and decisions back to the local units of government for them to be able to decide. Because it seems to me that that student and that parent and that teacher that's looking that child in the eye are the best people to be able to make educational decisions for our future. And Mr. Clausen, your comments on this issue? Uh, regarding, the, regarding the NEA, um, I, I realize they represent the teachers and, and uh, I have no problem with that, but I think they need to stay 
keep, uh, keep out of the educational process itself. Regarding uh, our K through 12 schools, um, I'm of the opinion that we need to get the federal government entirely out of education, and uh, I think even the state government, uh, it ought to be strictly a, a school district level situation where the parents and the, and the taxpayers in each school district have the, the authority to uh, set the policies, handle the administration, and do the full funding right at the, sco at the school district level. And I believe that's the best way to go. Thank you. Mrs. Dockey, you have some rebuttal opportunity now. I do have my facts straight. Congressman Brownback did vote to cut student loans by $10 billion. Fortunately, we had the moderates in the Senate who restored a lot of those, a lot of those dollars back to student loans. I think it's going to be critically important that we restore a United States Senate that has balance and moderation to, to counterbalance the House of Representatives and a lot of the extreme kinds of policies that they were advocating. So the facts are straight, the facts are documented in any commercial or statement I've made. Thank you. Congressman? And the facts are false and they're not documented and I did vote to increase it. And she talks about moderation. I'm delighted to have Nancy Kassebaum's endorsement and Jill Docking doesn't. Whereas she will support Ted Kennedy to chair that same committee. Do you think he wants to send educational decisions back to state and local units of government? I don't think that's the case. I do think what we do need to recognize here, though, is how hard teachers work and what all they're trying to do to educate our children. And it's a key issue for their future and for our children's future and for our country's future, that they do a good job and they be provided the tools and also the decision-making capacity to be able to work on these educational issues. I've got three young children, and we've just got to be able to educate our kids well to be able to have a good and bright future for this country. Mr. Clausen, your final comments on this no, issue? Not. You pass. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Steve Kraske with the Kansas City Star, and you will direct your first question to Congressman Brownback. I'd like to get your comments on three proposed constitutional amendments. Would you support amendments that would limit the number of terms members of Congress can serve, ban most abortions, and thirdly, allow voluntary school prayer? Congressman? Good key direct questions. I do support term limits. Um, I've supported those when I was Secretary of Agriculture. I support them in the Congress. I'll support them in the United States uh, Senate as well. Uh, on the issue of abortion, which I find a very difficult issue, I think it's an issue that should be sent back to the states where it was prior to 1973. So in that uh, sense, I'm going to do whatever uh, I can possible to see that that decision can get on back to the states and for them to be able to decide those issues. And on voluntary prayer, I support a moment of non-sectarian, non-denominational silence. Now, some people believe that we can do that by statute. The president believes that. Some people believe we need to have a constitutional amendment to do that. I'll support either way it takes to be able to allow, allow that to take place. And the reason is, I think we just need to be able to come back and talk more in the society about some values in this overall society and that no moment of non-sectarian, non-denominational silence is I think a step in the right direction. Mr. Clausen? Regarding term limits, yes, I would support such an amendment. Regarding banning abortion, uh, I feel the women of our society are entitled to make that choice for themselves. Uh, regarding school prayer, um, I, I think this needs to be left at the local level. Uh, the, the parents and and the students in the school districts are the ones that need to make this decision and not the federal government or even the state. And Mrs. Dockey? In terms of term limits, I do support um, a constitutional amendment for term limits. I would not support a ban on abortions. I am in favor of giving that opportunity to women to be made between uh, their doctor and their minister and their families. In terms of school prayer, we are discussing this in Wichita, Kansas at the time. I think it is a, a local issue. Uh, our school board is currently discussing the moment of silence. I, in fact, I think Steve Rose has written about that particular discussion. I think as long as it is a moment of silence and children are not felt that they have to do any sectarian prayer, it is a positive thing to do. I think it is useful for children to have an opportunity to reflect quietly at the beginning of the day and to say a prayer or have some private thoughts at the beginning of the day. We have some rebuttal time here now. Uh, Congressman, would you like to add something to this issue? Mm, I think the question is straightforward and don't need rebuttal to it. Mr. Clausen? Mrs. Dockey? Okay. 
Moving on, we want to let you know that in addition to the questions from our panelists, we also want to hear what's on the minds of voters during this election season. Watch. That balancing the budget is an appropriate goal, and if so, when would you work to see that we have a balanced budget? At what time would you like to see us have a balanced budget in the United States? And the first to answer will be Donald Clausen. This is a difficult issue <clears throat> uh, for me. Uh, it's paramount, paramount as far as I'm concerned that taxes are not raised. Uh, taxpayers today are grossly overtaxed. Um, uh, I would prefer seeing a lot of the what I call socialistic programs be moved back to the states or even to the local level and uh, uh, this is going to take some time. I, I think what we need is, again is that national referendum voting system so we can find out what our people really want in this country and, and we can then zero in on those programs they feel are outdated or no longer necessary and uh, there, there's no definite time for balancing the budget. All this is going to take a lot of time, so uh, uh, there's no definite date. All right, Mrs. Docking? I have signed a pledge not to raise taxes, but I feel very strongly it is critical to balance the budget. Why is it critical to balance the budget? Because I think it is the strongest pro-growth policy we can have. I've been in business in Wichita, Kansas since 1988. My job is to sit down with people and make sure they balance their budgets every day. I'm a financial advisor and a stock broker at A.G. Edwards, and I think it is irresponsible for America to leave debt, the enormous debt we created in the 1980s, to our children. I think the question is, how can we balance our budget and do it responsibly without having to slash and burn spending programs that are really investments in the future of our next generation, like education, investments like Medicare. I think we can do that with the proposal by a centrist budget, which I did, I would support had I been in the United States Senate at the time. It does it responsibly without having to slash and burn investments in the future in the next generation of Kansans. Congressman Brownback. <clears throat> it's an excellent question. It's one that this Congress has made a centerpiece issue of, and this is the first Congress in the past nearly 20 years that's actually passed a plan to balance the budget and do it by the year 2002, which is what I support, that we balance the budget by the year 2002. And to me, that's not enough. I think we've got to go even further and not just balance the budget, but start paying the mountain of debt off. That's over $5 trillion, as Mr. Clausen pointed out, and is a, is a growing... Uh, problem for our children if we don't start paying it off now. We need to do that. And I was on the budget committee that crafted the plan to put that on forward, that passed in the Congress, and we're now making progress on that. And it wasn't even on the agenda before. And as, for, as far as uh, Ms. Dockey pointing out the centrist budget plan, I've got a copy of that here. It's interesting to me to note that they say in discretionary spending categories, estimated savings $268 billion, but no way do they say how they're going to save $268 billion. We put forward real proposals, a real plan on how you can balance the budget, and it's critical we do that. Would any of you like to respond to your opponents? Mr. Clausen, you first. No. Mrs. Docking? Yes, please. Go ahead. Actually, there is great detail in the centrist budget as to how they're going to do the balancing and, and the saving of the spending. In that centrist budget, all, budget also, there are proposals to have the following tax cuts capital gains tax cuts, estate planning tax cuts, and education cuts. I think the point is that they are able to do that without massively decimating spending programs. I don't think it's fair to ask one group or another to sustain all of the cuts. What I do think is fair is for all of us to have a little bit cut, and I think if we're all asked to give a little, we will all be willing to balance the budget. Thank you. Steve Kraske has our next question, and Jill Docking will answer first. Rebuttal on I'm, that question. Did I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. But don't I'm we sorry. all we all get a yes, rebuttal I'm on? Sorry. I don't go mean ahead. to cut no, in on you. No, that's all right. But I just I wanted to point out the centrist budget plan. It's a four-page plan that I have here, and under the discretionary spending, and I I serve on the budget committee. I've worked on some of these issues. It says 268 billion dollars that they're going to fill in on that hole. My my point on saying this is it's easy to sit here and to say, okay, we're going to do it, but we're not going to cut any of these programs or that programs. When you actually get down to doing it, we've got serious problems. And there are very key things that you've got to do in looking to our future and saying, what is it that we're going to do, and we need to do it well, 
What is it can we no longer afford to do? And let's get out of those programs. We've got to preserve and protect things like Medicare. We've got to do strong on the national defense. These are tough issues that we've got to have real programs answering for those and real ideas coming forward with them. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, and Steve Kraske now does have our next question, and Jill Dockey will answer first. I'd like to uh, discuss Medicare. Uh, Congressman Brownback, you have voted to reduce the rate of growth in Medicare by $270 billion over seven years. Mrs. Docking, you said you could support a reduction in Medicare growth of $150 billion. Can each of you explain why you've taken the position you have and what all this would mean to senior citizens? And what I'm wondering is, would seniors have to pay more for benefits under your plan? I think everybody in Washington is afraid to really address the question of Medicare. You know, Medicare has to be cut in order to preserve the solvency of Medicare. The question is, how deep do the guts have to be? Congressman Brownback did propose $270 billion of cut. The centrist budget proposed $154 billion in cuts. I don't know why Congressman Brownback has only four pages. Maybe the copying machine was broken in Washington because I have stacks of pages on the centrist budget with great detail. I think the question is, what difference does the $270 billion and the $154 billion make to solvency and to services provided? Well, it's a cut in the services provided to the elderly in the state of Kansas. $154 billion will help with the solvency. What it doesn't have to do is pay for massive tax cuts. Let's address the issue of solvency. Let's start here and make some cuts and do it with moderation and balance. Congressman? Yeah. Well, Medicare doesn't have to be cut to save Medicare. There, nobody is proposing cuts in Medicare. Everybody's proposing continued increases in the overall funding levels for Medicare. We also did something else on these savings in Medicare because if you don't have an increasing Medicare but not at the same rate it's currently growing at, Medicare goes broke after the turn of the century. It goes broke and that's according to Clinton's trustees, President Clinton's trustees. So we have to have that rate of growth not be at the current level, which is about 10 some plus percent. My proposal, what I supported, was some 7 percent increase in the rate of growth of Medicare. We created a lockbox on the savings in that and said that has to go back into Medicare and not be used for tax cuts, as others have misrepresented it to be. What I proposed as well in this is that people have options that are opened up to them under Medicare. And they don't just have to stay in this current plan they're in in Medicare that they can have, but they can go in and use their old insurance plan if they'd like to, or if they want to stay in, or get into an HMO or some sort of managed care type of system. And we try to open up options for people that are currently in Medicare to save and preserve and protect it. Mr. Clausen? The uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, problem is a, is a very difficult one for me. Um, perhaps we can get back to time like in the, uh, the early 40s, the Halliburton Fund, where the government, these were government funds, where they would pay for one half of the hospital costs and local citizens would pay for the other half and, 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 and part of the uh, uh, commitment by the hospital then was to take care of the, the poor. Um, perhaps we need to look in areas like uh, uh, retired doctors, uh, perhaps they'll, they would agree to uh, uh, volunteer some of their time, kind of as mission work. Uh, 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 this whole issue is, 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 uh, is, a, is a difficult issue. Uh, Medicare, and, I mean medical services are absolutely required both by the poor and the elderly and, uh, and must be given, I feel. Uh, but we've also got to find some way to cut, cut back and, and perhaps uh, volunteer way might be a solution. Okay, let's go back around the table with this same question for rebuttal time. Uh, Mrs. Docking? Okay. Since I haven't been to Washington, I don't know Washington speak. What I understand is numbers. There's either a $270 billion cut or a $154 billion cut. And there have to be cuts, folks, to maintain the solvency of Medicare. There isn't any question about that. The question is, where do we start? And I would suggest we start at $154 billion. And are we going to have to continue to look at that system and reform that system? You bet, because it isn't fair to the people on Medicare not to maintain the solvency of Medicare. So we have to fix the system, but we have to do it with balance and responsibility. 
And I'm certain if we ask all Americans to give a little bit, they will do so in order to provide for the solvency of those people on Medicare, those about to go to Medicare, and the younger generation of Americans. Congressman? Well, I believe uh, Jill was in Washington last week, uh, so made it there at least that period of time. You know, there's something else that we also ought to hit on in the Medicare issue, because this is a critical issue. Nearly 35 million Americans get their health care from Medicare. A number of my relatives do as well. I think that's the issue of fraud and abuse in the system. We need to be able to figure out how we can get rid of some of the fraud and abuse in that Medicare system. And one thing that I support here is asking that people that use Medicare and that, that receive that, if they see any fraud or abuse of any services they've been provided, that they be allowed to turn that in and then a portion of what is saved returned back to them as some other way that I think we can get at some savings in that system. And Mr. Clausen, do you have any final comments on this All question? Right. All right, we'll move on to the next question and it will come from Steve Rose and uh, Sam Brown back will answer first. Let's talk about the Second Amendment. Do you think that it was the intention of our founding fathers to allow Americans to carry concealed weapons and to own assault weapons? Well, I think it was the intent of the Founding Fathers, as they said in the Second Amendment, uh, which is allow uh, the citizens the right to bear arms, uh, is what I see is involved in the Second Amendment. Then you draw it down into specifics uh, of, well, what does that mean, the right to bear arms? For instance, assault weapons, true assault weapons, have been banned for some lengthy period of time. These are weapons that once you pull the trigger, multiple shots come out. And those have been banned since sometimes in the, sometime in the 30s. And I don't think people have any problem with saying that that's not a violation of the Second Amendment. Uh, I didn't see particularly that the Brady Clause was a violation there. Yet some of the other further permeations of that, where you get factors put into place, uh, such as happened in some recent bills, uh, that could be interpreted in many ways, I think can be interpreted against it. But the bigger point here is this. A lot of times this has been substituted, the issue of gun control, as an issue of dealing with crime. When what we need to do with crime is if people are committing a crime, lock them up. If they're committing it with a weapon, lock them up for a longer period of time. And Mr. Clausen? <clears throat> I support the Second Amendment, and I would vote for conceal and carry in the state of, uh, uh, the Second Amendment, I think, gets down to uh, um, the right to defend yourself, and uh, uh, it, it's also a safeguard on, on uh, excesses of government. So I, I support the Second Amendment, and I believe that's all I've got to say on that. Mrs. Docking, your comments, please. Yes, we must allow citizens to bear arms, and I think we must allow people to engage in hunting, which is a very popular sport down in Wichita, Kansas, and the surrounding western Kansas where I live. However, I do believe that it is appropriate to have the kind of gun control we have currently. I don't believe we need any more expansion of gun control, but I would certainly support the ban on assault weapons and the Brady Bill. My opponent, and actually, Sam, I don't know if you support repealing the ban on assault weapons, but I think that makes some good sense in terms of trying to control guns from the people who shouldn't have those certain kind of guns and trying to keep guns out of the hands of people who do not need to have guns. The Brady Bill will eventually be fully computerized so that we can do that without a waiting period, and I think that makes more sense, and when that happens, I think the waiting period can be abandoned. Some rebuttal time now, Congressman? Yes, I want to make clear that uh, I do support the Second Amendment. It is a part of the Constitution, just as the First or the Tenth Amendment is in as well. Uh, a second point I'd like to make is that this Congress passed into law and was signed into law bills that if people committed crimes with weapons, they would be locked up for longer periods of time for committing crimes with those weapons. To me, that's what we need to be talking about on crime control here on this issue is how are we going to deal with violent criminals? And I think we need to lock them up for longer periods of time, particularly if they're going to commit a crime with a weapon. And the second issue is I think we need to support and do everything we can to support stronger families as ways that we can have people that are supporting one another and helping them out uh, all along the way, whatever we can. Mr. Clausen, do you have any other comments on no. this issue? Mrs. No, Docking? No. Mrs. Docking? Look, I have a very strong family, and I was held up at gunpoint. I want a certain measure of gun control in this society as a mother, and as a wife, and as a person who's concerned about my family. 
I think we can have reasonable gun control. I don't think we need a slippery slope and we don't need to insist that all guns are outlawed. Hunters need to have their guns. People need to be allowed to have guns in their home. But let's be reasonable about this, folks. There needs to be reasonable gun control. I wonder if we could uh, clarify uh, the question about the repeal and the ban on assault weapons. Could I just ask each of the candidates to say whether they would vote uh, yes or no on whether to repeal the ban on assault weapons as had come up before the Congress previously. Okay. Congressman Sam Brambeck, yes. answer first please. Uh, that issue came up <clears throat> during this session of Congress and I voted to repeal the assault weapons ban because of the things that I spoke about here earlier. That it was on not assault weapons but on weapons that once you have to pull multiple times, multiple shots, and it was a list of five factors, any three of which could make the, the gun banned. That could be interpreted <coughs> very, very broadly. Plus, within this same ban was contained language that allowed people to be locked up for longer periods of time that committed crimes with a weapon, which is something I feel very strongly we ought to do. That was contained in the same bill. That's why I voted that way. And Mr. Clausen? Yes, I would vote to repeal the assault weapons ban. And Mrs. Docking, how would you vote? Without question, I would not vote to repeal the ban on assault weapons. All right, we're going to take another question now from a concerned Kansas constituent, and this one deals with Americans with Disabilities Act. Let's look. That's what they will do to protect the rights of 49 million Americans with disabilities against discrimination. Did you all hear the question? Okay. Uh, she'd like to ask the, the uh, candidates what they will do to protect the rights of 49 million Americans with disabilities against discrimination. And uh, Mr. Clausen, you're the first to answer, please. Well, I support the ADA Act, and, and uh, I, I believe that pretty well covers my position. All right, then Mrs. Docking, your comments, please. Yes, I, I would, I clearly support the ADA Act, but I, I would bring up a point about using some balance on the ADA Act. I mean, I think there are instances where it is an enormously unreasonable, uh, the kinds of impositions put on businesses to, to respond to ADA. I think we need to look at the kinds of things we're asking businesses to do. I sat with a businessman recently who uh, told me of the enormous frustration and enormous expense he had to build a hot tub in the basement of a health club and then he had to build a new elevator so that people could go up and down in the basement <coughs> and he was just kind of plain frustrated with the fact that nobody could respond to him reasonably. I think the ADA is enormously important to protect people but I think the federal government has got to listen clearly and become a little bit more receptive to businesses and help us balance the interest of businesses and protection of people who are disabled. So all I'm asking is that the federal government listen more carefully and try to make these laws more user friendly so they are more effective. And Congressman? You know, one of my good friends is a quadriplegic and uh, uh, helped get this law passed, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. It is a key law and something we should enforce. Uh, I agree fully with what Jill Docking is saying in this particular case. And let me give you, let me give you the example of what I've seen taking place in my congressional district. In Lecompton, Kansas, they've had a ramp going up. Lecompton's a town of some 700 people. They've had a ramp going up to their fire station um, that served very well for people in wheelchairs to be able to get up. It was about a 17-foot long ramp. ADA came out and they said, no, 17 foot, feet won't do. It has to be 20. Uh, they've never rejected anybody with a disability from getting in. That's a case where you do need more, more flexibility coming out from the federal government for them to be able to work more with people that want people with handicaps and disabilities to be able to get in. And there's a case where we need to be listening and working and be much more flexible and not as dictatorial. And that's something I'll be working for as well. Are there any other comments? Of on this particular issue? If not, we'll move on. And our next question comes from Steve Rose, and Jill Docking would be the first to answer. Uh, yes, I, I, we've heard a lot about uh, Newt Gingrich and Ted Kennedy tonight. Uh, I would be interested in knowing, I think our audience would too, uh, what do you think should be our greatest concerns about electing your opponent, but please leave out any other names of any other elected officials that are serving today. Just talk about your opponent, if you would, please. Well, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I believe that my opponent is not representative of the broad base of moderate Kansans in the state of Kansas. And I refer back to his own primary where he referred to Sheila Fromm, the candidate he ran against in the primary, 
is a liberal because of her voting record. I know Sheila Fromm. Sheila Fromm has been a very conservative state senator in the state of Kansas. I thought it was enormously unfair to brand her with the kinds of things Congressman Brownback was branding with her and may be indicative of the fact that he is off the scale in terms of representing the middle. We have a tradition of moderation and balance. I believe that's what Kansans want in their next U.S. Senator. I come from that tradition in terms of my own family background and strong business background, as well as marrying into the Docking family, who believed austere but adequate was the way to run government, run business, and run a household. Congressman Brownback? Well, um, I think Jill Docking's an excellent person, but She's not representing herself, uh, she's representing herself different than what she is. 1988, she chairs the Michael Dukakis presidential campaign in Kansas. Michael Dukakis is the most liberal nominee that the Democrats have nominated over the last 20 years. She's chairing the campaign for him and now running as somebody that says she's a moderate, conservative, centrist uh, candidate, uh, representing that she's in the Kassebaum tradition. When Nancy Kassebaum has endorsed my candidacy because she knows that I represent closer to her standpoint of views than what my opponent, Jill Docking, does represent. Uh, she doesn't support a balanced budget amendment. Uh, most Kansans do support that. Um, she's not being clear as to how she would balance the budget and laying forward clear choices of what you would actually do to balance the budget and instead just saying very general terms and we won't cut this or cut that. But at the end of the day, choices have to be made. And it seems to me that those are the things, and a lack of experience, uh, are reasons of concern uh, in looking at Jill Dawkins' candidacy. And Mr. Clausen? Well, I'd like to champion the taxpayers' cause over at this point in time. Uh, uh, neither one of these candidates here has uh, mentioned the taxpayers' plight in our society today, but it, it's not just these two candidates, it's, it's all of Washington, I feel like, our whole political system. We have program after program and legislation after legislation passed and the taxpayer is never given a second thought. Uh, he's just assumed that he's he's a bag full of money and and anything the political elite in Washington think is a good idea they'll pass and they'll pass on the payment of it to the taxpayers and I think it's time that we taxpayers start having a voice in Washington, D.C., and I hope we get some kind of organization put together to do that. Thank you. Any further comments from either of the, Mrs. Docking, for your first, go ahead. I, th I thought the rule was not to mention any national figure, so I'll, I think Michael Dukak is probably qualified as a national figure. But, you know, I think the centrist budget, which I would support, has very clear definition as to how to balance the budget, what kind of spending cuts will be made, and what kind of tax cuts would be made. Perhaps the best people that understand how to run business are those that have been business and not been professional politicians. I come from a tradition of the docking tradition where my father-in-law schooled us in the fact that you are to raise your family, be involved in your community, start your own business, serve in public life, and then get out have a life before you get in, go get a life after you get out. We do not believe in professional politicians. We believe the best people to balance a budget are people that do it every day in their own businesses. Congressman Brownback? Well, the Brownback family doesn't boast a uh, political heritage of people being involved in politics for generation on generation. We're farmers, uh, been farmers for a number of generations down south of Kansas City, about 50 miles. I do want to uh, come back to what Mr. Clausen said because he's got a key point, and that is that the American people are taxed to the max, and that's why I voted to cut taxes. That's why I support a cut in income tax rates and a cut in capital gains tax rates because the average Kansan now works until about May the 7th just to pay the taxes. It's too long, and we need to cut that back at the same time that we're balancing the budget. Mr. Clausen, do you have any final comments on this issue? Okay, the next question then will go to Congressman Brownback, and it comes from Steve Kraske. I'd like to talk about another major issue of our times, which is Social Security. Do you favor means testing for Social Security <coughs> recipients, whereby those who earn an income above a certain level would not receive benefits? If not, what's your plan for saving the system? Uh, 
my plan for saving the system are twofold at this point in time. Number one is that we need to put in real assets into Social Security. In other words, right now what's taking place is Social Security funds are taxed, tr go into the trust fund, and then move automatically out into the flow of overall government. <coughs> I think we need to put real assets into Social Security. The second thing we need to do to, to maintain Social Security is balance the budget. In 15 years, the baby boomers start retiring. And at that point in time, instead of having a Social Security surplus, we start having people pulling more out of Social Security than what's going in. We've got to balance the budget now and start running account surpluses at this point at, as soon as we can so that we'll be able to meet those obligations that we're going to have in future times. Now, I've supported means testing in Medicare, and I think that's appropriate there, but I have not uh, supported it in Social Security. And Mr. Clausen, your plans for Social Security? Well, here we have another socialistic, prob uh, socialistic program that is heading towards bankruptcy, which is the, uh, the cornerstone of all socialistic programs. Um, I would like to see whether our populace thinks it's about time uh, for Social Security to uh, either be totally revamped or maybe even looked at, if, at phasing out. You know, in 1937, when Social Security started, the maximum tax was $60 a year. It is now $9,600 a year. That's a 16,000% increase. Now, in order to keep Medic or Social Security from going bankrupt, the tax rate has had to be increased 21 times and the tax base 30 times. And it's probably time to take a look at this in depth, see how, what kind of support we really have in our society for this. And there are ways to phase out, none of them painless. They're all, they all take sacrifice. But um, I think if we take a look at the history of this plan, uh, there's clear indication to me that we need to take a, and, and take a serious look at it, at the viability of it. Mrs. Docking. I oppose means testing because I think it threatens the integrity of the system. The problem will be that for those people making a lot of money who are young people, feeding into the social security system, if we means test those that clearly can afford to be means tested out, I think you will have a taxpayer revolt because they'll be saying, why am I putting all my dollars in when it's going to be means tested out? How do we solve the social security system? Because I do financial planning every day with people, I would suggest the following. You must protect the people currently on social security and those getting close because they've made plans and they have evaluated how much they need in retirement and it's too late to change the rules. For baby boomers, my suggestion is that we look at the, at the Carrie Simpson Act, which is a bipartisan proposal to allow baby boomers to put 2% of the 12% of their withholding in something like an individual IRA. If they are allowed to do that, because I'm in the brokerage business and understand this, if you give people the opportunity to grow their assets a little bit more aggressively, at least the baby boomers will have a chance at retiring with some assets. And Congressman Brownback, you have additional comments on this issue? No, I don't. Okay, and Mr. Glosson? No. And Mrs. Docking? No. Okay. We'll move on now and take one more question from a voter. This one deals with a topic on the minds of so many, health care and welfare reform. They were going to reform uh, health care or welfare. How would they do it? And would they cut out, would they um, make it to where it would be more strain on the lower class, middle class, or more for the upper class. Did you all hear the question? Mm -hmm. Mr. Clausen, you, uh, your answer first, please. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in order for us taxpayers to afford the welfare system in, in, in our society today, we're going to have to bring the welfare system back to the county level. Uh, what we have now in Washington, D.C., of course, there was just a, uh, a new Welfare Act uh, passed here, but we taxpayers have been sending a dollar. For every dollar we send in Washington, D.C., only 28 cents finally gets back to the welfare recipient. Now, United Way can get 90 cents out of a dollar back to, the, uh, to their beneficiary, so we have a grossly inefficient system set up. We need to get it back to the county level, get away from the state and, and the federal government involved. We get away from all the overhead, all this extra. We have all this area that you can have fraud and abuse in, 
If you go down to the county level, you have local people working with local beneficiaries, and they have a lot more access to churches and, and charitable groups, and I think we must get that to that point where we taxpayers just won't be able to afford the bill. Mrs. Docking. I'll address the health care piece of that, of that issue. I've taken issue with the, the radicalness or perhaps extremism in the Gingrich Congress. Let me take issue for a second with President Clinton. I believe his health care plan was another example of a radical plan that wasn't going to work. While he had some wonderful ideas, what he was attempting to do was throw the entire system up, something we built for 30 years, and fix it overnight. We can't do that with health care. Does it need to be fixed? You bet. How are we going to do it? Well, I thought what Senator Kassebaum and Senator Kennedy did made a lot of sense. He took two United States senators who couldn't disagree more philosophically. They came together in a compromise in the Kassebaum-Kennedy bill, which I think addressed in a very good way the issue of portability, allowing people to move from job to job and still maintain their insurance. That is the kind of compromise and balance and moderation we need. What we don't need is grid gridlock and people not agreeing with each other and being ideologues. We all need to come together. We all need to give a little bit and address the issue of health care. And Congressman Brownback? <clears throat> this Congress we just completed last night that gave me this raspy voice produced both welfare reform and health insurance reform, along with farm program reform, telecommunications reform, line item veto, congressional reform, lobbying reform, and, a, and the first balanced budget in over 20 years. The way I would do it is the way we've done it in pushing forward in this Congress in welfare reform. We ended welfare as we know it. We sent it back to the states in block grants and said to the states, we have failed the people at the federal level in dealing with this. Have the states deal with it on all of it except food stamps, and that remains at the federal level. On health insurance reform, what came forward was Senator Kassebaum coming forward with a plan where she said, here are some major reforms that we can do in health insurance for portability and get us out of job lock. I was an original co-sponsor of that legislation in the House of Representatives and put it forward. And this Congress, this supposed gridlock Congress, the people that actually passed these two key reforms and changing these systems for the better. Now we have a little bit of rebuttal time. Any other comments, uh, Mr. Clausen, on this? No. Mrs. Docking? Yes. I think we have a long way to go um, on making our system a better system. What I think is important is that we elect people who are centrist, who know how to cooperate and bring together compromise. We can't afford to shut down the government anymore. We can't afford gridlock. We all have differing opinions. What is important is that we elect people in the center who believe in moderation and balance and can bring together competing ideas and competing signs and find resolution for all of us. And Congressman? Well, I think it's more important that we get people elected that get things done and that have an idea what they want to try to do when they go to Congress. And I've laid out plans of what I want to do in Congress. We've gotten a number of those done. I'm laying out plans of what I want to do in the United States Senate and representing Kansas. And we're going to be able to get those things done as well. <clears throat> Seems to me that that's what's critical and what's important. This is a historic Congress that's accomplished these things. And yet others seem to try to label it one that's locked in gridlock. And yet look at the major accomplishments that got done just in these two fields of welfare reform and health insurance reform. Two years ago, President Clinton tries to nationalize health care. And, and tries to add to welfare rather than doing what we did with it. I'll be able to get things done in the United States Senate the way we have in the House as well. Before we go to our two-minute closing remarks, I would like to uh, uh, throw in a, a very brief question here uh, from the moderator, and you will have 30 seconds each to answer this question. It could be a yes or no question if you so choose. But the question is, would you support funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? Mrs. Docking? I absolutely do support that funding. However, I will tell you, because I know they're near and dear to your heart, but I don't, I don't think there are any sacred programs out there. Everybody's going to have to give a little, like I said to you, but I absolutely support the funding as long as we can make them cost effective and they are on the board like everybody else's. And how do you feel about that, Congressman? Well, on those two issues, on NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, I've supported a phasing out of that program over a period of three years and putting a trust fund together at the end for them to operate on their own. And the point is simply this, we're broke. 
and we just can't afford to do everything that we've been doing in the past. And it seemed like to me that this is a way that we could be able to get this done. It's nice to be able to say we're going to keep everything and do a little bit less of each thing. We're five trillion dollars in the hole. Corporation for Public Broadcast, I'd like to do the same sort of phasing out over a period of time. And I used to work for an NPR affiliated radio station, not with this voice. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that we're going to have to do to get the budget balanced. And Mr. Clausen? No, I would not support this. All right. Thank you all very much. We're going to go on now to our closing statements. A reminder, you will each have two minutes, and we will begin with Congressman Brownback. I want to thank you all very much for joining us this evening and for watching and listening where each of the candidates stand so that you can become a better informed voter in making your own decisions. You know, it, it seems like to me that this election is about which direction we're going to choose for the country to go in the future. Over the past two years, we've made some historic changes. And we've made those historic changes along a path of decentralizing decision making, a smaller federal government, balancing the budget, individual decision making, families and communities being the core and centerpieces rather than a big, massive federal government directing things out of Washington. And if we keep going that way, we win. But if the liberal left gets back in control, and if the Democrats win, if Jill Docking, my opponent, wins this election, the, the liberal left will be back in control of the United States Senate. <clears throat> Ted Kennedy will chair the committee that Nancy Kassebaum is currently chairing. He believes in nationalizing health care and in a bigger, stronger federal government. That's not the way we want to go. I don't think that's the way Kansans want to go, of saying, well, we need to call Washington to ask, as we have been doing in the past. Or we need to wait in line to see if we can do that, as we've had to do some in the past. It seems to me that that's what we're about, is which of these directions do we choose to go? Because that's who's going to be setting the agenda once it goes to Washington. We've made historic changes these last two years, as I've listed some earlier. Farm program changes, where the farmer now decides what to plant, not the government. We've made changes in health insurance and welfare reform. We've done a gift ban in the House of Representatives. We've cut the budget for Congress over $200 million and done away with things like subsidized haircuts and beauticians, things that have been there for 40 years that we didn't need to have. Which way are we going to go? And I think for our future, to restore the American dream, we need to give power and authority back to the people, back to the states. That's why I'm running for the United States Senate, and that's why I'm asking for your vote. Thank you, Congressman. And Mrs. Docking, your two-minute closing statement, please. Thank you, KCPT and Public Television, for this opportunity. You know, we do all have different visions of America. I come from an immigrant background. My grandmother and grandfather came to this country with no money and no ability to speak English. And America cradled our family in her arms and allowed us to grow a business, grow in the community, to grow our families. But let's talk about what we need to ensure the American dream for our children. My vision of America is an America where everyone's included. We have a responsibility to balance the budget, to continue to invest in our children and the safety of our community. We have a responsibility to take an active part in the process. You know, I'm asking you this evening to accept a challenge. Vote for the person that best represents you, regardless of partisan interest. Get involved in the political process. I accepted a challenge on June 12 to enter politics and leave a comfortable life. I'm blessed with a wonderful husband, great kids, and a very successful career. But I believe it's critical that centrist in Kansas reclaim leadership in this state. I'm enormously proud of all the people from across the political spectrum that have accepted the challenge to work with me. Moderates must make a stand in this election, for we truly are at a historic crossroad. I need your help and I need your vote to ensure the future of Kansas is based on the same sense of moderation, balance, and fairness as is our rich history. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to each and every one of us this evening. Thank you. And Donald Clausen, your closing statement, please. Again, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my, top, my four top priorities are as follows. Number one, I want to enact legislation on campaign finance reform, lobbying reform, and term limits. Special interests and big money now control our government, and we must put a stop to this situation. It's absolutely essential. Number two, we must take and reduce the tax burden on the taxpayers 
And we do this by putting us taxpayers in control of our government with this national referendum voting system I mentioned earlier. So we taxpayers can personally vote on all the major issues and can set parameters on those issues. Number three, we must shrink the federal government by eliminating all non-federal agencies and non-federal programs. This is the only way we taxpayers can get our government costs under control. For the most part, this means getting rid of those functions not provided for in the U.S. Constitution. Fourth and lastly, I want to make sure we protect our good paying blue collar jobs, protect our high standard of living, and protect the middle class that we have. We must protect our industrial and manufacturing businesses, and we do this with trade agreements that look out for American interests, not foreign interests. It's time we Americans look out for ourselves so we can once again feel secure about our jobs, once again take home a paycheck that will pay the bills, once again have plentiful jobs available for our young when they graduate from high school. Our current trade agreements are gutting our financial base, and this must be stopped. Thank you for your attention. And thank you all very, very much. Sam Brownback, Jill Docking, Donald Clausen, thank you for sharing your ideas and your vision for Kansas. And I wish you all luck uh, this uh, election season in November. And we hope you'll all go to the polls as well. A special thanks to our panel, Steve Rose, Steve Kraske. Thank you very, very much. Good questions. And thank all of you for joining us for this special program. We encourage you to stay tuned for PBS Debate Night, the future. Congress is coming up next, and at 9 o'clock this evening, you will meet the candidates running to replace Nancy Kassebaum in the U.S. Senate as they participate in a live debate from Manhattan. Now, on October 16th and October 6th and 16th, you can watch the presidential candidates debate right here on KCPT, as well as a debate between the vice presidential candidates. That's coming up on October 9th, and there are other political programs coming up on KCPT that you will not want to miss. For now, I'm Cynthia Smith. For all of us here at KCPT, thank you for watching and have a good evening. You've been watching a Senate candidates debate from Kansas. This is the third of six candidate debates airing tonight.